Well, if it's Wednesday, it's no ordinary hump day. It's Meet the Press Daily. Good evening. I'm Chuck Todd here in New York City, and we are in the center of a breaking news storm right now, sort of the post Mueller wrap-ups. You're looking live at Capitol Hill, where in just a few moments we expect to hear from Speaker Pelosi, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Nadler, House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff, holding a joint press conference after Mueller's historic testimony. The biggest question is perhaps, what do Democrats do now? As we speak, we've been getting tape of the president, who was speaking to reporters at the White House, and no surprise here, he is claiming vindication. Here's some of what he said at the top of his remarks on his way to a fundraiser in West Virginia. This witch hunt that's been going on for a long time, pretty much from the time I came down on the escalator with our first lady, and it's a disgrace what happened. But I think today proved a lot to everybody. In those remarks, the president lashed out uh, my colleague, Hallie Jackson, who asked him about comments Mueller made suggesting that he actually could be indicted after he leaves office. We'll have more on that in a moment. The president clearly um, uh, misheard the question. What we don't know is that did he intentionally mishear the question or not. But folks, if the goal for the Democrats today was to reestablish the facts of the case against the president, that he welcomed help from the Russians, tried to cover it up, tried to obstruct the investigation, then today's hearings were a success because Mueller largely did reestablish all of those facts. But if the Democratic Party's mission among House Democrats was to have Mueller breathe new life into those facts in a way that grabbed the attention of the American public in a sense of urgency, well, then today's hearings were probably a failure. In many ways, Mueller affirmed the Democrats' case against the president, and he delivered moments that in any other time in modern history would be viewed as Exhibit A, in an impeachment proceeding, including this exchange about him potentially indicting Mr. Trump for obstruction. Could you charge the president with a crime after he left office? Yes. You believe that he committed, you could charge the president of the United States with obstruction of justice after he left office? Yes. Mueller testified that the president's written answers to his investigation were, generally speaking, untruthful. In other words, the president may have lied in writing, Mueller also affirmed the Democrats' case against the president for his actions surrounding the Russian conspiracy to get him elected. The campaign welcomed the Russian help, did they not? I think we have. We, we report in, our, uh, in the report uh, indications that that occurred, yes. The president himself called on the Russians to hack Hillary's emails. Uh, there was a statement by the president and those general lines. Donald Trump was trying to make millions from a real estate deal in Moscow. To the extent you're talking about the, uh, the uh, hotel in uh, Moscow? Yes. Yes. And when Donald Trump called your investigation a witch hunt, that was also false, was it not? I'd like to think so, yes. Well, your investigation is not a witch hunt, is it? It is not a witch hunt. More proof that part two of Mueller's testimony, a lot more compelling uh, in some cases than part one. But overall, Mueller was an extremely reluctant witness for Democrats. He declined or deflected questions nearly 200 times by our count. At times, he seemed to lack a full grasp of what was actually in parts of his report. And at times, he pulled his punches when the president's allies questioned the legitimacy of his work. But if you want to know if this hearing was a success for Democrats, you've got to first figure out what exactly their goals were. And if marshalling support for impeachment was the goal, what do they do now? Well, we've got a great team in line for us tonight, reporters, analysts, and experts to break down what Robert Mueller said and didn't say. Pete Williams, our justice correspondent for NBC News, Casey Hunt, Capitol Hill correspondent. Uh, she was in the hearing room today, now waiting for the press conferences to start with Pelosi, Schiff, and Nadler. Jeff Bennett, our White House correspondent. I got Andrew McCabe, the former acting director of the FBI. He took over after James Comey was fired by President Trump. And Chuck Rosenberg, a former senior FBI official and U.S. attorney who's worked closely with Robert Mueller in the past and is also an MSNBC contributor. So, Pete Williams, let me start with you. You've covered Mueller, I think, the longest Chuck Rosenberg, I think, has worked with him um, longer than, than your coverage of him. What today was the Robert Mueller you were used to, and what today was the Robert Mueller that you weren't used to? Well, today is clearly not the same uh, take the hill Robert Mueller, who was a hard-charging FBI director and would be sometimes combative with members. Um, th you know, I don't think any of us expected to see that Robert Mueller today. Uh, for two reasons. One is uh, he's 74. He'll be 75 in two weeks. Um, he is appearing before the committee uh, really against his will uh, with a mission in mind 
not to say very much, which I think he succeeded by his own measure because he was there under subpoena and determined not to go beyond what, we, what he said in his, in his report, and he largely abided by that. But he's clearly, you know, he's an older person now. He's not the same well, aggressive I, let me highlight, that he was. Let me highlight, I think, the moment that sort of made that crystal clear. First, it's the back and forth with Congressman Ted Lieu in part one of the hearing. Let me play that. That's number three bite, guys. You did not indict Donald Trump. It's because of OLC opinion stating that you cannot indict a sitting president, correct? Uh, that is correct. Now, before we go to questions, I want to add one correction to my testimony this morning. I want to go back to one thing that was said this morning by Mr. Liu, who said, and I quote, you didn't charge the president because of the OLC opinion. That is not the correct way to say it. As we say in the report, and as I said at the opening, we did not reach a determination as to whether the president committed a crime. You know, Pete, in, we were all actually around the table wondering if Mueller heard both parts of Lou's question, and we wondered whether he was saying what we thought Lou thought he said and what we all thought he said, and of course, he ends up walking that back. How important? Yeah, I think there were several of exa examples of that today. And just to be clear about it, the OLC opinion, of course, is a factor, the one that says you can't indict a sitting president. But here's the role it played. It is not the situation that the team decided that Donald Trump committed crimes, but they couldn't say so because of the OLC opinion. Quite the contrary, what the report says and what Mueller made clear a couple of times at the hearing today is that having marshaled the potential obstruction of justice I examples, they deliberately said, we can't even decide whether these constitute a crime because of the OLC opinion. So it's just sort of where you put the OLC opinion on the conveyor belt that plays a role. And frankly, I think that was a similar sort of thing with his question from uh, Ken Buck from Colorado right. about could you indict the president after he leaves office? Mueller says in his report, one of the reasons we can do it is that the OLC opinion says you can't indict a sitting president, but you could indict one after they leave office. And I think the president or the Mueller was there thinking about any president not saying he right. could indict this president after he leaves office. Casey Hunt, it seems as if Democrats are most excited about two exchanges. One was one that I played earlier, Adam Schiff's back and forth. Um, and the second is the first exchange Jerry Nadler had with Robert Mueller. Let me play it and then ask, talk to you on the other side. The president has repeatedly claimed that your report found there was no obstruction and that it completely and totally exonerated him. But that is not what your report said, is it? Correct. It is not what the report said. So the report did not conclude that he did not commit obstruction of justice. Is that correct? That is correct. And what about total exoneration? Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. Now, in fact, your report expressly states that it does not exonerate the president. It does. So, Casey Hunt. How do Democrats feel and do they wish they could take those two moments and, and have those be the moments everybody sees over and over again? Well, Chuck, I think that 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 question is, is still to be answered in terms of how the American public digests what happened today, how many people watched these these hearings gavel to gavel and how much will watch summaries that include those very exchanges. Uh, and those headlines are very clear. I mean, the president is constantly tweeting and claiming no collusion, no obstruction, total exoneration. Robert Mueller very clearly refuted that very directly. Uh, you put those kinds of sound bites next to each other with the president saying that and Robert yeah. Mueller saying it back. And, you know, there you go. It's pretty cut and dry. But I will say that, you know, there's still a lot of questions about how much this fundamentally changes the political calculus at hand. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, has been very reluctant to embark on impeachment proceedings. She has continued to say that the best way, in her view, to get Donald Trump out of office is at the ballot box. And she's been battling in many ways behind the scenes with members of her own caucus who want to move more aggressively. And this was really the key, the absolutely key test. And we're still waiting uh, to hear directly from Nancy Pelosi. We're going right. to hear from her here in a few minutes. And right now, House Democrats are huddled behind the scenes with the House counsel. So that's the yeah. lawyer that takes over uh, and, and spearheads any litigation on behalf of the House of Representatives. So that's where this process is right now. We're not doing impeachment proceedings, but Democrats are pursuing things in the courts. So right. I think the question here is, can Nancy Pelosi figure out how to thread the needle to keep those Democrats happy, considering what happened today? 
uh, with the other ongoing uh, procedures. Because I have to tell you, the initial read on this is, uh, from talking to aides and members who are close to Nancy Pelosi, is that this isn't going to fundamentally change the game. It's not going to fundamentally change her mind. It's not necessarily the kind of blockbuster situation that could cause a sweeping change in public opinion. They're really watching that right. uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, this is, uh, you know, as you and, and Savannah were talking about uh, throughout the day today, this this is a political calculation uh, for them. And if they go too far in Pelosi's view, they risk ultimately jeopardizing the ultimate goal that Democrats have, which is, of right. course, a Democratic president in 2020 and Trump out of office. So I think that's where we are right now. But we'll see, of course, in just a few minutes. Before we dig in um, to to more of what Mueller said with Andy McCabe and Chuck Rosenberg, quickly, Jeff Bennett. Uh, the president, is he just trying to optically declare victory? Because the substance of today was not good for him. Yeah. I guess he can feel good that he had House Republicans defending him. But today didn't come across to me. It's like, it's like oh, my God, if he doesn't win re-election, he's, he's got all sorts of problems. Right, Chuck. And look, I've been talking to White House officials and people close to the president all day. And the, and the mood, their attitude, they're downright gleeful. They're feeling upbeat. They're feeling vindicated. To your point, the president is unsurprisingly unmoved by all of the day's events, including some of the more damning assertions uh, conveyed by Robert Mueller under questioning uh, from Democrats and a, a couple of, of Republicans. And one of the ways we know that is because one of the first things the president said to reporters in just the last hour was to call the Russia investigation again, a ridiculous witch hunt and a hoax, even though Robert Mueller said today explicitly to lawmakers that the Russia investigation was no such thing. So, yes, the president is setting aside entirely the substance of what transpired today, and he's focused mainly on the optics. They believe, and when I say they, I mean White House officials to, to include them, they believe that Robert Mueller, with his sort of halting performance, his nearly 200 uh, declinations and, and, and deferrals, really robbed Democrats of the thing that they wanted the most. And that was yeah. for him to sort of have this lively animation of his 448 page right. report. And because he wasn't able to do that, their view is that people are left believing what they want to believe. And that is a fight that these White House officials and the president think that they can win because they know how to fight it. I mean, the president right. has been under a cloud of, of controversy and alleged criminality ever since he was elected. And so they believe that they can right. leverage that right wing propaganda machine to keep things moving along straight to the 2020 election. Right, let's talk more about the substance here. Chuck Rosenberg, you, you, you had said earlier in a conversation we had that, look, Robert Mueller did exactly what he told us he was going to do three months ago. How did Democrats do in extracting the Mueller report out of Robert Mueller today? Uh, not that good a job, I think, Chuck. Look, working for Bob Mueller was one of the great professional privileges of my life. I learned to take the man at his word completely and directly. If he says he's going to do something, he will do it. If he says he's not going to do something, he won't do it. And when he said on May 29th, I think that was the day of his press conference, yep. um, that his report would be his testimony. He was, said it. He, he was almost as a warning. Hey, guys, if you call me up there, I'm not going outside the bounds of this report. So why in the world would anyone be surprised unless they didn't take him at his word? Uh -huh. And by the way, if they were waiting for him to be animated or lively, yeah. that's not the Bob Mueller I knew. And by the way, I don't mean that disrespectfully. Right. He's serious, sober, dignified. They could have used that to their advantage. Of course they could have. He's a man of tremendous integrity. Yeah. And by the way, also, I guess it's the second by the way, um, <laughs> You see how a man of integrity acts because he could have skewered the president or the attorney general or anybody else for that matter. Right. But he played it straight down the middle, which is the Bob Mueller I know. Andy McCabe, you've also worked closely with Robert Mueller as well. I, I, same thing. If you were, had been asked advice about how to extract more information out of Robert Mueller, what would you have told um, uh, Jerry Nadler and Adam Schiff? Well, I, I think actually, Chuck, that the Democrats approached that in exactly the way I would have advised them to had I been asked, which I wasn't. But, um, you know, as, as Chuck just mentioned, no one should have been surprised mm -hmm. that Mueller was going to confine all of his mar uh, remarks uh, to the substance of the report. So that being said, their goal should have been to get as much of the most significant material in that report mm -hmm. um, out and communicated to the public 
in a way that's um, memorable and easy to understand. For my money, the best way to do that is exactly the way they approached it, which is with analyzing each category of obstructive behavior within the elements of the offense. I thought they did that effectively, um, and I thought that, uh, uh, you know, Director Mueller went along with that in the way that uh, we expected he would. Uh, but let me, should there have been, should this have happened sooner? You know, they waited, this is now July, correct me if I'm wrong, July 24th. We had his press conference May 29th. We had the bar version of this in April. I mean, a lot of time has passed. Yeah, far too much time, um, in my opinion, Chuck. They mm. should have uh, really endeavored to get this testimony out as soon as possible, yeah. especially in light of the um, conflicting messages about the conclusions in the report coming from the attorney general and then the response from Director Mueller. So it was unfortunate that so many weeks have gone by uh, with this void of information in terms of uh, what's actually in the report, of course, for, for those folks who haven't read it. And I would say, if I could point out one other thing, yes. Chuck, um, it's been mentioned a lot today. This is his 90th appearance um, on the Hill. I would venture a guess that this is the first time he's ever appeared on the Hill following the release of a 400-page mm -hmm. statement. Um, so to compare uh, the way he conducted himself today and the way he answered questions today with all of his appearances of old right. is a little bit of a apples and oranges comparison. Fair enough. Uh, Control, I want to play number seven, excerpt number seven, and this is having the, the decision uh, was about, and, and Chuck Rosenberg, we talked about this. There wasn't, to me, enough questioning of Robert Mueller on this, which was his decision not to subpoena the president. Mm -hmm. Let's go through the back and forth, because actually, Mueller gave a little bit, more so than he had given in other answers in responding to his decision not to subpoena the president. We were almost towards the end of our investigation, and we'd had little success in pushing to get the interview of the president, uh, we decided that uh, we did not want to uh, exercise the subpoena powers uh, because of the necessity of uh, expediting the end of the uh, investigation. What did you think of the president's written responses, Mr. Mueller? Uh, it's certainly not as useful as uh, the interview would be. In fact, in fact, you, you pointed out, and, and by my count, there were more than 30 times when the president said he didn't recall, he didn't remember, no independent recollection, no current recollection. And I take it by your answer that it wasn't as helpful. Um, that's why you used words like incomplete, imprecise, inadequate, insufficient. Is that a fair summary of what you thought of those written answers? That is a fair summary. And I, pre I presume that comes from the report. And yet, sir, and I ask this respectfully, uh, by the way, the president didn't ever claim the Fifth Amendment, did he? I'm not going to talk to that. So, Chuck, uh, Mueller's like, this entire hearing never turned into what I thought it could turn to at time, which was an oversight hearing on, on, on his investigation, mm -hmm. on some of the, the things that he made. And Democrats were too busy puffing up his resume than they were pushing at him going, okay, why'd you do this and not this? And why'd you do this and not this? This is the closest we got to any sort of accountability yeah. of decisions he made as an investigator. Yeah, uh, which was fascinating to me because, uh, you know, the, the report is an extraordinary work of investigative and intellectual, you know, heft. That said, I do wonder why they didn't push this one issue. In any case, uh, establishing the intent of the defendant is always the hardest thing to do, mm -hmm. um, particularly in a sort of a white collarish sort of case. Right, what did you intend to do helps drive the decision of whether or not we charge you. And so you need to talk to the person, you need to talk to the subject. Who is the subject here? The President of the United States. Written answers are always a bad substitute. And oh, by the way, the President even refused to answer questions on the obstruction issue. Right. There were. Well, those imprecise and unhelpful answers were all on the Russia interference side of the investigation. There was nothing in writing on the obstruction question. So do you push the issue? The Mueller team decided, A, that they had enough, and B, it would take too long. But there was no sort of requirement that it end on a certain day. Right. They could have pushed the issue. Easy for me to second guess it. I understand that. But um, I think it's an issue they could have pushed. Andy McCabe, as an investigator, do you feel like this is a complete investigation? Paul Manafort never cooperated. The president never was under, uh, was never subpoenaed. Can we say definitively uh, this is a completed investigation? 
You know, Director Mueller and his team had obviously much less control over Paul Manafort's decision to cooperate, and we're all familiar with the mm -hmm. kind of tortured tale behind that. But with respect to their decision not to pursue an interview of the president through extended litigation, I understand his reasons for, you know, deciding that the time that would take wasn't worth the effort. Um, but it, it's a, it is a curious decision to any investigator. It is a very reasonable criticism, I think, of the the, uh, of the team, and it's one that Director Mueller and the rest of the team will have to live with. Um, I agree with Chuck that, in, that particularly in a situation like this, an interview with a subject um, is just an, an absolute essential element that you would pursue until its logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's a fair amount of head scratching, I think, wondering about um, why they decided uh, that wasn't uh, worth, uh, worth the effort. Uh, Andrew Mitchell has joined me uh, after doing some uh, work on the network side during the special a, a few minutes ago. Andrea, you have seen different machinations of congressional investigations and where they go. Today was a moment. Is it a moment that leads to something bigger, or is today going to be an epilogue on, on the Mueller report? I think it's an epilogue, and I think that's very sad, not for the reasons that some of the partisans might think. I think the issue of Russia's attack on our election mm -hmm. is not getting enough traction. And yes, Robert Mueller was more engaged in the afternoon session on that subject, but it's shameful, shameful that Republicans were so focused on trying to undermine the origins of the investigation that they did not deal with the fact that has been concluded by, by all of the intelligence agencies under Obama, and of course they're professionals, so they, these are not people of a different political party, and the career intelligence agencies all concluding, as did our allies in the UK and elsewhere, that Russia attacked our, our elections and that it had to be investigated and responded to. Now you're pushing me into what was my pet peeve earlier today. And I talked with you, Chuck Rosenberg, about this, and Andy McCabe, you and I have talked about this, so I'm not blindsiding either one of you. But um, the more bipartisan agreed to problem of what happened was, was the Russian interference. Should Democrats have led with that? Led with the crime? Led with what everybody, where there is con some consensus? And then they could have maybe depoliticized part one. A little bit. Well, perhaps. And one answer to that, Chuck, is that often when you tell a story, you tell it chronologically, right? So what happened first? We told the story backwards today, didn't we? Right. Russian interference happened first. Um, and so what were you interfering? You were interfering with Russian interference. I, know, I should say what were you obstructing? Right. So, yeah, logically you tell it in the order in which it happened. And I think that can be a little bit confusing and a little bit unsettling if you're new to this thing. Uh, Andy, I mean, if you're making a case and you're trying to tell a story, that's what I keep not understanding. Because we were told by many House Democrats they're trying to bring the Mueller report to life. Okay. Mueller made part one the crime. He made part two obstruction. I, I know that, that Nadler's calling the shots here, but it felt like House Democrats made a political decision. They thought, well, they have a stronger obstruction case. So let's start with that. Maybe stronger, maybe more interesting, maybe just the volume that people have been focusing on because it's easier for them to understand. But I agree with you. The story would have been better told in the way it was presented in the report with the collusion side first. And, and I'd add to that that it's clearly the part of his work that Director Mueller feels more strongly about. So if what More you're comfortable seeking, with the conclusions, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So if you're seeking a greater level of engagement and passion from Director Mueller, one way to do that would have been to start him off talking about the incredible threat that we face ongoing to this day from the Russian government. And I would add to that, Chuck, just one thing. The the stark contrast in Director Mueller in his performance of rectitude and caution, extending himself to talk about how seriously he thinks about the fact that the Russians continue to attack the very foundations of our democracy, and then contrasting that with the president, who in all of his remarks yeah. today that, that I heard you play at the top of the show, has really said nothing other than this is a great day for me. Yeah. Not a single comment about the fact that we are still under attack from our most formidable foreign adversary. It's just Precisely. truly yeah. shocking. I, I go back to something. I, I truly don't believe he thinks it's a big deal. 
Well, I think that that is that, that there's either two conclusions. Either he knows he's worried that he did something wrong or he doesn't think it's a big deal. Neither should be something that makes sense. And it's a, in complete defiance of norms. There has never been an election where a political party has welcomed dirt, political uh, you know, opposition research from a foreign adversary. As our friend Michael Beschloss figured out, Hubert Humphrey was offered help from a foreign entity called the Russians, and he turned it down. Mm -hmm. uh, Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel, so thank you. Now do me a favor. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there. Click on any of the videos to watch the latest interviews and highlights from MTP Daily and MSNBC. You can get more Beat the Press content every morning in the First Read newsletter. Uh, if you're tired of content that you don't know anything about where it came from, you don't have to have that problem with us. NBC News, MSNBC, MTP, and the Meet the Press mindset right here for you on YouTube. Subscribe now.